Again, it gives me great pleasure to reintroduce to you Brother Derek Isaacs, Creation Ministries International. He gave us a tremendous amount of excellent information this morning. I am so thankful for those of you who would be with us this morning. It will tie together well with what he has to say tonight, a very exciting and important presentation, Dinosaurs or Dragons. And so we welcome again to our pulpit, uh, Brother Derek Isaacs. Hello, everyone. Hope you had a good Lord's Day today. Uh, see, I think there are a couple new faces out there. Uh, my name is Derek Isaacs. I'm with Creation Ministries International. Uh, we've been around for 32 years. We have offices in seven countries. Our flagship production is Creation Magazine, and we have subscribers in 110 countries for that magazine. So that's uh, that's what really kind of what our ministry does, and, and we are primarily focus on defending Genesis, defending that first literal six-day creation and seventh-day rest against primarily the secular intrusion of the theory of evolution. Now, one thing that we have to contend with in defending Genesis is the dinosaurs, right? You know, a friend of mine who's a senior pastor, uh, very skilled theologically, uh, he admitted to me that he didn't know what to do with the dinosaurs from a biblical perspective. Theologically, where do dinosaurs fit? Now imagine being in his shoes, and if a teenager or a child comes up to him in his church and asks him, you know, Pastor, what do we do with the dinosaurs? Can you explain them to me through the Bible? And if he's not able to give that child an answer, well, what's going to happen? That child is going to seek that answer from probably a secular-minded science teacher who's going to try to use dinosaurs to convince that child of evolution in millions and millions of years. So really, we all have to think, how would you respond if someone challenged you on dinosaurs? We have to have a keenly prepared mind. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We have to make a defense for what we believe in. It's the hope of Christ. Now that's why I wrote the book and produced the documentary, Dragons or Dinosaurs. It's to give the church, to give you a tool, a resource, to answer the dinosaur question. Okay? It is the, basically because dinosaurs, more than anything else, are used to convince children and deceive them of millions and millions of years of evolution. I saw an article, uh, actually uh, someone gave it to me at one of my talks, so it was an article from the UK, and they actually had it that and dinosaurs were the ambassador to evolution. So that is really what we're doing, dealing with. Now, a few years back, I participated in a dinosaur excavation up in Glendive, Montana. And that's me there, staying at the dig site. It was about a 25-minute off-road journey just to get to where that dinosaur was being excavated. And it was, we had a, team, a small group of guys. It consisted of guys from Texas, Colorado, Montana, and me in Sweet Home, Alabama. And we all went up there to dig this thing you know, out of this cliff. And so we lived in a tent. We li all lived in tents over a week as we excavated. Now, there, it is dry, arid climate out there. There's no running water anywhere. So have you ever worked all day long in the dirt, hot and sweaty, you know, and then gone to sleep that night and not taken a shower? Now, can you imagine doing that for a week straight with a bunch of other guys? We discovered all kinds of new smells, okay? I mean, there were things growing on me. I was looking at my arm and I was like, hey, that's a potato, you know? I mean, it was just a kind of a gross situation. Lots of fun if you're a guy, though, you know? Now, this is the picture of the base camp. And so the, the dinosaur that we were excavating was right up on top of that hill. We had to climb up that hill, that really steep cliff, each and every day. You know, the dinosaur just didn't die in a convenient place. And we had to carve out these steps just to get to it. Um, now, this is the actual dig area. And the tent is erected over the fossil. All right? And we do that for two reasons. One, to protect uh, the fossil from what we're, you know, from the elements. to protect what we're uncovering. And two, it's a hot, dry heat. And so it also helped us not dehydrate. Um, we also dug some drainage ditches right out of the beginning going away from the find. And the reason was if by chance we got into one of those western storms that all of a sudden a big flood would come through, a lot, a lot of water, we wanted to protect what we were uncovering because water is a catastrophe. And if it hits that thing, it will remap everything that it hits. Now the dinosaur we were excavating was a type of ceratops. Now we've all probably heard of the triceratops. 
which means three horned face, right? Now, this one is on display in the Glen Dive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum in Montana. Now, most people do not know that Triceratops is probably just a juvenile Torosaurus. You see, the vast numbers of dinosaur species that are out there are probably just duplicates of each other, and they were fossilized at different ages. So you have a, a child, a teenager, adult, if you will. Um, now, our dinosaur was a ceratopsian, but it was not a triceratops because it had some really unique frill features on its head. Uh, right here, you see it. This is him. That's what we were digging up. His name is Big John. Now, his name, that's because he's big, because he was, he was uh, from the nose to his tail, about 34 feet in length, which is a huge ceratops. And John, well, that's just the name of the guy who found him, and that's kind of how it works. If you find yourself a dinosaur, okay, excavate out, you can name him whatever you want him to be. You know, if I found a dinosaur, I could, it'd be, it could be Dinosaur Derek, you know, that's just how it works. Now, we excavated a little more than 60% of his fossil, which is a really good find. Um, and the fossil was not articulated, meaning it wasn't all put together nice and neat. It was kind of, it was discombobulated, which means it was, it was associated, but it was like a jigsaw puzzle that we had to put together. The kind of pieces that he was in is this. Oh, not that. But right here, what I want to show you, I skipped the slide, but that is a tooth of what we found inside of, like, in the area of Big John. And that's a raptor tooth. So Big John was being fed upon before he got submerged in the water and mud, and that is why he was probably broken apart quite a bit. This is the size of the piece that he was in. Now that, right there, is about yay big, if you can get your mind around that. And it's a part of the rib. Now, do you see how this fossil is embedded in rock around it? To free this fossil, we have to, like, carefully chisel it out. Uh, but this is not normally done to site because fossils are really fragile and they break apart. So it gets taken to the lab. But before it goes to the lab to do that, we put a cast on it. So if anyone's broken an arm or anything in here, you know what a cast is. That's basically what this is. Now, once the creature's all put together, they fill in the missing links or the, you know, the missing pieces of bone that they don't have. And they come out with a pretty good idea of what the creature looked like. Like this. Now... That is you, that what you see in the museums is not the actual fossil itself. That's a cast of it because the fossil would be just too rare to put into a museum like that. And something like this would cost like $80,000 for a museum to actually buy. So it's very expensive for museums to buy these things. And it's because so few people can take this thing from start to finish and make it look like that. But how do we know what this creature looked like besides their skeleton? This is a cast of fossilized ceratopsian skin. Sometimes, rarely, the skin gets fossilized. This demonstrates the scaly nature of the creature's exterior. So we know, because of evidence, that they would have been scaled reptiles. This would have been the, the skin of Big John. Here's another um, picture of fossilized um, theropod skin here. And so we have this, we understand they are crocodilian in, in exterior. They were scaly, hard very, very reptilian. This is not conjecture. This is hard evidence. Now, so here's the million dollar question. When did this creature and Big John and the other dinosaurs, when did they live? Evolutionists are going to demand that they died out over 64 million years ago, aren't they? They'll be dogmatic about that. But a straightforward reading of the Bible does not give us that option. Exodus 20.11, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, it says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God then further qualified those days in Genesis by saying that each had a morning and an evening. Genesis 1.5, And God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. You see, a day is measured by the rotation of the earth. And the earth takes 24 hours to rotate. On day one, the earth was created rotating, and light made the day, and darkness made the night. It was a literal 24-hour day. And God gave us specific records of what he did on those six days of creation. Day one was space, earth, time, water, and light. Day two was atmosphere. Day three is land and vegetation. Day four was sun, moon, and stars. Day five was the first animal life, and those were the flying creatures and the sea creatures. Then day six, 
And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Dinosaurs are land creatures. Therefore, biblically, they would have been created on day six. The Bible does not give us any other indication whatsoever of of other land creatures being in some pre-assumed or some assumed prehistoric timeline. Okay, according to the Bible, there was never a time when dinosaurs ruled the planet. Also, day six, and God said, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness." See, day six is when Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, man and dinosaur both created on day six. Therefore, man and dinosaur would have walked together on the planet at the same time, according to the Bible. And did you know that the Bible is really our history book of the entire universe? And if we add up all the genealogies of the Bible, you know, the Adam and Eve lived only approximately 6,000 years ago. So here's a defining point for all of us. Are we willing to take the Bible at face value? Even though secular academia is going to say dogmatically, that dinosaurs died out 64 million years ago. Are we willing to accept that the Holy Spirit is more knowledgeable than we are in matters of history? It comes down to this. Who is your authority? Is it the word of God or is it the word of man? This is a matter of conviction and we all have to ask ourselves, where does ours lie? And I'm not going to mix words with this. If dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago, we have a problem with Genesis. I am not afraid to say that. However, if dinosaurs walked with man, then evolution has a massive problem. Massive problem. See, Louis Jacobs, a former president of the Society of Vertebrae Paleontology, and an evolutionist, said this about man and dinosaurs living together at the same time. He wrote, Co-occurrence of men and dinosaurs. Such an association would dispel an earth with vast antiquity. The entire history of creation, including the day of rest, could be accommodated in the seven biblical days of the Genesis myth. Evolution would be vanquished. Now first notice his bias against Genesis. He considers it a myth, doesn't he? But then, he concedes a very important point that if dinosaurs and man did walk together, then even the biblical creation week would be a valid belief. That is a huge concession for him. But why would he place such an ultimatum on man and dinosaur coexistence? What's the big deal? The answer is this, is that so much evolutionary theory has been based on the idea of millions and millions of years, and dinosaurs have been the poster child to sell this idea. So if this prehistoric era or age of the dinosaurs is taken away from them, and dinosaurs can be shown to just be within the biblical window of 6,000 years, then Jacobs acknowledges that the house of cards that evolution is built on just simply collapses. So today, what we are talking about in church, dinosaurs, is a very, very big deal, both to Christians and to the evolutionary faith. We will explore this topic of what I call, uh, we'll explore the topic of dinosaur man coexistence through what I call dinosaur historicity. And that means looking at the dinosaur through the eyes of real, authentic tangible history, not the make-believe prehistory, I'm talking about the real thing. And to explain, let's take a closer look at the idea of prehistoric era and ask ourselves, what is history or how do we know about history? You see, our history is available to us when some sort of an account is left for us by someone who eyewitnessed an event. The Bible is a true historical record of our existence, and it came from God relaying what he did and saw to his chosen vessels who were men. And they then recorded what they were told to record, and it was passed down through the, to the generations. Now the Bible, though, also contains prophecy, which is why we know it, was, it is the mark of divinity. You see, prophecies are like God's personal signature, and anything that has been proven to tell the future over and over again has my trust to accurately tell me about the events of the past. So, if history is eyewitness events that are then recorded, then what is prehistory? It's an interesting word, isn't it? It's a claimed era of time before there's history. There's no written or oral record of it. You see the problem with the very idea of prehistoric time. How do we know it even existed? Yet, according to evolutionary science, all these incredible creatures, like dinosaurs and, and everything else that they say lived then, 
we're in this undocumented time. And the idea of a prehistoric time has a major conflict with the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You see, the Bible gives us our written history from the very beginning. A complete prehistoric time never existed according to our Bible. God has provided a record for us from the beginning. He was never going to leave us in the dark. He was never going to leave things for a matter of speculation. Think of God's graciousness to give us such a completed history. But the evolutionists who reject the Bible are inventing prehistory with sheer imagination and recreating man in the image of chaos and chance, aren't they? So even though the prehistoric era has no recorded history, there's no evidence of it, it doesn't stop the evolutionists from claiming one. So what is the claim of history for the evolutionists? You saw this picture this morning from South Dakota. And you can see the definite lines in the rock formation. Evolutionists treat this, these layers, like long ages of history. Therefore, something that is buried at the bottom like a fossil, they would conclude is a, long, is a lot older, maybe even millions of years older than something buried at the top. Now, we remember that this morning, for those that are here this morning, that is pretty... We can shoot holes in the, in the way that they are dating their rocks. Now look at this dinosaur fossil embedded in rock. Therefore, they believe that rock is 65 million years old or older. They would think that dinosaur fossil is also that old. But what becomes very powerful, and we know that the ages of rocks can be doubted because of what we did this morning. But what is more powerful than just refuting their method is providing countering, countering evidence. That, that really shows that within the biblical window of 6,000 years, dinosaurs existed. For refuting is one thing, but providing evidence for our worldview is quite another. So our search means we're going to go through an abbreviated journey of what I did in my book. We're going to look at theology, oral history, mythology, paleontology, archaeology, and written history to see if all of these had evidence of man and dinosaur coexistence, and if they confirmed each other. Does the information overlap? See, evolutionists, because they believe that dinosaurs died out over 64 million years ago, would only consult paleontology on this list because they have a presupposition that man never saw dinosaurs. Therefore, the disciplines of history that we have, they think are irrelevant. So this approach we're doing tonight is unique to biblical creationists. And it is a clear weakness for the evolutionists that they do not exhaust these historical disciplines looking for answers. Now, first, there are critical dates that we need to understand. In the year 1822, a man named Gideon Mantell was said to discover the first dinosaur. 1822. It was the tooth of an iguanodon. That's what this creature is. According to secular science, this was the first time man ever knew that a large-scaled group of reptiles ever inhabited the earth. 1822. Therefore, before the 19th century, the biggest animals we supposedly knew about were just like the elephants and the whales. Now, did you know that the word dinosaur was not even created until the year 1841? The word is a relatively new English word. Therefore, if man and dinosaurs coexisted hundreds of years ago, or a few thousand years ago, then these reptiles would not have been called dinosaurs, because that word did not, was not created. They would have been called something else. So, let's begin with mythology. Okay? And one of the fascinating creatures in mythology is the dragon. Some dragons were sensational. Many cultures, especially the Chinese, tried to explain phenomenon through dragons. You know, they said that dragons controlled the floods, the tides, the sun, you know, whatnot. But not all dragon legends are like that. If you scrape away all the sensationalism and just deal with the creature at the base of the legends, a very common creature is described. In fact, Carol Rose, an expert in mythology, defined what is the general physical description of the creature called a dragon in ancient mythology. She wrote, and I'll read this to you, the most general description of the occidental dragon, that's uh, European, is very similar to that of the oriental dragon, being an enormous, elongated, scale-covered body like that of a crocodile, often with vast wings like those of a bat, and having huge legs like those of a lizard with long claws. It may have a toothed dorsal ridge extending to a long serpentine tail, usually barbed. Its head may be like that of a vast lizard or crocodile, but with either a crest or horns on the head. Now, if you know your dinosaurs, this is a nearly perfect compiled image of all the dinosaurs with a pterosaur 
thrown in the mix. That's the bat-like wings. Look at this picture. This is a pterosaur reconstruction on top and a bat on the bottom. Notice the, the structure of the, the wings. Look at the shoulders, the elbows, the claws coming out the top, the membrane likes. It is nearly a perfect description. If you're going to see this pterosaur and try to, s to describe what it looked like and someone says, it has bat-like wings, that is a nearly perfect description of that creature. Here is a recreation of a Spinosaurus. He carries many of the characteristics of dragons. You see the dermal spines, the claws, legs like a lizard, head like a crocodile. He wraps up most of the characteristics all by himself. And check out the barbed tails on this particular stegosaur. The features of dragons, the dragons of myth, actually match the features of known dinosaurs. And this is Dracorex, which is a horned dinosaur who's actually named after a dragon. You see, the word draken is the Greek word for dragon. Now, this reconstruction of the Dracorex fossil, and this is done by National Geographic, the paleontologists who named this fossil Dracorex were so stunned at how much it matched the imagery of dragons that they named him after a dragon. And ironically, they named him after a dragon in a Harry Potter movie. His actual name is Dracorex Hogwartsia. That is the actual name of this dragon, or of this dinosaur. So irony really has no bounds there. Now, Carol Rose went on to say something else about dragons that is quite notable. She said those dragons were a common feature of legends and folklore from ancient times in virtually every culture of the world. Dragons are a phenomenon. It does not matter what continent you go to, these giant reptiles are, speaking, are spoken of everywhere. So the big question is, is how did cultures, let's say in South America, and cultures in China virtually 2,000 years ago, tell stories of similar creatures, and they feared these same creatures, if all these things were completely fictitious and just matters of imagination? Did virtually every culture of the world create the same mythical creature in which to fear? And what are the odds that this supposedly mythical creature also matches scale for scale the dinosaurs? Has anyone heard of the term historical selectivity? Okay. It is a term that simply means historians cannot capture every little detail of history. Historians have to be selective and choose what highlights to pass on. Now take into consideration historical selectivity and now consider that virtually every ancient culture of the world made it a point to record and pass down stories of giant reptiles they called dragons. There was something both spectacularly ominous, you know, just about these creatures for all these historians to shout with one unified shout that they should be remembered. And this needs to be said that it's not only creationists who have connected the very large dots between dragons and dinosaurs. The famed atheist Carl Sagan tried to rationalize away the dragon legends because of the obvious connection to the dinosaurs. He wrote, The pervasiveness of dragon myths in the folk legends of many cultures is probably no accident. It is a worldwide phenomenon. Sagan recognized that the stories of dragon are remarkably similar to dinosaurs, and he tried to offer an explanation for it but from an evolutionary worldview. Now his proposition was essentially this, that we inherited memories of dinosaurs that are 100 million years old from our non-human ancestors. That's what he said. That we essentially have reincarnated dinosaur memories and that man made up those stories about dinosaur mem that they made up stories about dragons from our reincarnated dinosaur memories. This is what he said. The R complex, which he calls reptile complex, is functioning in the dreams of humans. The dragons can be heard hissing and rasping and the dinosaurs thunder still. He was even comfortable enough to use the term dragon and dinosaur interchangeably. He went on to say, we may each of us be replaying the hundred million year old warfare between reptiles and the mammals. So the question is not really do dragons seem like dinosaurs, but the question is why do dragons seem like dinosaurs? Carl Sagan thought that we inherited memories, and that explains it. You can believe that at your own risk. Now, another idea from evolutionists on why dragons match dinosaurs is from Adrian Mayer, uh, because she uncovered for herself that the American Indians in North America have stories of their people encountering real living dinosaurs. 
And let me just say that the oral history of cultures is different than legends. Oral history of the American Indians is so detailed that historical experts actually rank it on par with ancient European history. So this is very, very um, solid stuff. In Mayer's book, she quotes uh, the famous um, Navajo historian Vine Deloria. And Deloria said this about dinosaur stories. There are dinosaur stories. Well, it doesn't get more clear than that, does it? So there is oral history, not mere legend, but oral history meticulously passed down that claimed eyewitness accounts of dinosaurs by the indigenous Indians of North America. In my book, Dragged for Dinosaurs, I go through a lot of those stories. Now, Mayer does not doubt that the history exists. What she doubts is the truth of it. Because she is an evolutionist, her starting assumption is no man ever saw a dinosaur. So her presupposition makes her believe that Indians can't possibly be telling the truth. So the evolutionary faith filters how she views the evidence. Therefore, to explain away these dinosaur stories, Mayer created an elaborate idea called Fossil Legends of the First Americans, which is also the title of her book. Her entire assertion in this book is that Indians, rather than seeing the dinosaurs alive like their history claims, really created legends of dinosaurs based on finding their fossils in the ground, figuring out what they were, then they made up real life scenarios about these dinosaurs and told them as fables. Then those fables got passed down mistakenly as real history. That is her idea. Now, for Mayer's idea to work, the Indians would have had to possess wonderful skills of fossil excavation and have understanding of paleontology that's really better than the paleontologists today. Then those Indians would have failed to pass down that history because, well, that skill is simply not in their history. And then on top of that, the Indians would have had to go against deeply held pagan religious views just to accomplish this. And I'll show you what I mean. Mayer herself uncovered this. She wrote in her book, some Lakota healers still warn people not to touch any fossil bones because they possess very strong medicine powers. So how could the American Indians be avid fossil hunters when their own pagan religious leaders instruct them not to mess with the fossils? Going further, she wrote again, traditional Navajos avoided all contact with corpses in places where the spirits of the dead may be. Funeral practices also help explain why all kinds of bones are avoided. The dead were not deeply buried in the ground, but left in the desert, which means that any bones one encounters might belong to ancestors or monsters. Since it is hard to distinguish animal bone fragments from human, it seems best to steer clear of any skeletal remains. But wait a minute. If Indians can't distinguish between a human bone and an animal bone, and therefore they steer clear of all skeletal remains, and how in the world are they studying the fossils so completely that they're accurately re reconstructing these things, flesh and all, enough to tell real life stories about them? But do you see that her own research refuted her own hypothesis? Her hypothesis is they dug these up and they figured out what they were, but her research told her what? Well, the Indians aren't going near bones. See, Mayer provides a perfect example of how faith filter, the evolutionary faith filters how someone views the evidence. Because the data was right there, but she needed to believe in that timeline of millions of years that she couldn't even see the clear contradictions in her book. Now let's move um, to the oral history of the Aborigines in Australia. And this story came with a drawing. An Aborigine man drew a picture for Creation Ministries International about a story or history, and this is it which told of a large creature that had killed one of their own people. If you look on the inside, you got a person inside the belly there. Unfortunate for him. And everyone, and basically the rest of the tribe went out to try to kill this creature. Well, this creature looks like a plesiosaurus. It's supposed to be dead for millions and millions of years before man, but that's what that looks like. Another picture that was drawn by the Aborigines to show um, that, another picture that was drawn by the Aborigines is a story about the bunyip. And here is the bunyip. The creature on the left is the bunyip, and right here on the right is a reconstruction of a hadrosaur. The two are truly a remarkable likeness. The only real difference is the chunkier nose on the bunyip. However, that's cartilage. And we really don't know where the cartilage was, was on creatures because that decomposes. So really, that creature may be a better likeness than what our modern paleontologists are doing today. Now, 
Remember, the evolutionists have offered two explanations to why ancient people talk so frequently about big things that sound like dinosaurs. Let's review them real quick. You have Sagan's reincarnated 100 million year old memories or Mayer's ancient bone experts who are afraid to go near bones. That's what they had. May I suggest to you that there's a different answer, that these people actually were telling the truth in what they saw. Now, I know someone in here may be going, okay, this dragon stuff is kind of interesting, but isn't there a fly in the ointment in this? What about the fire breathing? I mean, someone had to bring that, had to be thinking that. You know, all through history, you hear about dragons breathing fire. What about that? Well, we've all heard about the electric eel, right? That can electrocute an adult human. That sounds pretty shocking. All right? Now, but have you heard? I know that was bad, right? Okay, but have you heard of the bombardier beetle? All right, that little hot shot in Africa that's alive today? This is him. This little dude has two glands in his rear abdomen, and they store chemicals. Separately, inside of him, they stay neutral. But when he is attacked, he fires out these chemicals and they mix in the air and they reach 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But not only that, the chemical mixture actually begins to detonate. He's called the bombardier for a reason. Here's another picture. There is actual smoke and charring that gets created from, from this emission of him. It is an absolute detonation system. And it matches very closely what fire breathing may have been like. And so when we look at, we hear stories about fire breathing and we look at Job 41 that talks about the Leviathan able to have smoke coming out of him and, and flames coming out of him. There is no naturalistic reason to doubt that because we have a creature alive today that has a very, very similar attribute and that's the bombardier beetle. Now let's move on to archaeology. And what we want to see is that is there evidence in archaeology that would, comp that would add confirmation to the mythology in oral history. In the year 1496, Bishop Bell died and he was buried in this tomb in the, Cor in the Carlisle Cathedral in the UK. All right? In the brass inlet surrounding the tomb, there are two creatures um, in carved with their heads intertwined that I'm going to point out. Here's a picture of them. Now, I'm not sure you can really see that very well. I'm going to zoom in on the one on the right for you. And I'm going to place a seropod dinosaur, like an Apatosaurus or a Brachiosaurus, okay, underneath it for comparison. Now, part of the brass on the top is worn down, but look very, very closely here. What you'll see is that these two creatures match very, very well. Look at the length of the tail. Look at the body, the barrel-like body, the girth. Look at the stance of the legs, the joints of the legs. Look at the length of the neck and the size of the head and the ratio there. These creatures have a very, very good likeness, yet this was carved in 1496. Evolutionists say mankind never discovered dinosaurs until 1822. Yet in 1496, they carved a very good seropod dinosaur on that tomb. Now we're going to look at the other creature because its head's intertwined. And here it is. Now, I'm going to, I can see the head and the neck where it's at, but it's, it's pretty old and it's been worn down. So I'm going to add an enhanced image where I just, where we just basically drew the head and the neck where it is on this so you can see it. All right? There you see. So that's what that creature looks like. Now, it looks like a seropod dinosaur. It's similar, a little different slope to it and things like that. But it has these barbed, it has these barbed thing, you know, a barbed tail on it. Now, a lot of seropod dinosaurs don't have that feature. It's a really unique feature. Well, look at this, though. The Shunosaurus does have that feature. And I'm going to show a picture of just those two tails. And I got this from a good friend of mine, Vance Nelson. He just wrote a book called Dire Dragons. It's all focused on archaeology. But look at the tails. So what we have in, that bra in, in the brass carving are two seropod dinosaurs. One is a very, very unique dinosaur that has a barbed tail on it. Absolutely fascinating. Let's go over to America now. Now that is me on location. I am, I'm right down here. And where I'm trying to get to is under what is called Kachina Bridge because there's a petroglyph down there. That's a rock carving that was carved by the Anasazi Indians in 1200 A.D. That's me. I actually climbed up this kind of, it's not a cliff. It's nothing heroic, but it was kind of a 10-foot you know, flat rock face we had to get up there. And that's me happy pointing at it. You probably can't see real well what it is. So I'm, this is another enhanced image so you can see this creature. 
There it is. Undoubtedly, it was carved in 1200. Now, Fran Barnes, an authority on rock art of the American Southwest, wrote this. There is a petroglyph in Natural Bridges National Monument that bears a startling resemblance to a dinosaur. I could not agree more. It's amazing, isn't it? You can clearly see the head, neck, body, tail. And up close and in person is absolutely spectacular. And all of us, everyone can go see it. It's just at Natural Bridges National Monument in Blanding, Utah. Now, in the 1200s, in Cambodia, there's a stone temple and it has a carved it has carved creatures all through this stone temple. It's really remarkable. And here's one of the pictures, and I put a stegosaur next to it for comparison. There's the creature up here. There is no other creature known that has those plates running all the way down the back into a long tail and out the back. It is absolutely incredible. The only thing that matches this is some sort of type, some type of stegosaur. How did they know what to carve if they had not seen it? Then this is the best representation I've ever seen of man knowing what dinosaurs were. And this is from a, it's a quilt from the 1600s. And the reason why it's the best because the, the craftsman was just so good. Now at first glance, right here, this is the quilt from the 1600s. Some people at first glance may say, well, isn't that just a crocodile? I'm going to, Vance Nelson also is the one that um, showed me this in his book. I'm going to zoom in on this so you can get a good look at it. Now, you may think it's a crocodile right out the gate, but it's not. Careful inspection shows otherwise. Look at the elongated neck of the creature. That is not the neck of a, of a crocodile. Okay? Also, it has some really crazy teeth, which you're not really able to see, I don't think. But its teeth are protruding all around its mouth. I mean, in a really weird way. And it's just a unique, unique toothal structure. Now, what I'm going to do is show you side by side a creature called the Nothosaurus, which is a dinosaur, which supposedly died out hundreds, just millions and millions of years ago. The Nothosaurus was put in the same stance so that every last detail and ratio could be compared. My friends, this is a perfect match down to the last toe, nail, and the protruding tooth. You have the exact ratio of tail to body, body to neck, neck to head. You have the same joints in the legs, the same number of uh, toes, claws, and the exact same teeth protruding. This is a remarkable likeness from the 1600s. How did they know what this creature looked like if it went extinct millions and millions of years ago? There's no possible way, and they have a knight killing it. Now let's move on to written history. We just saw we saw archaeology, oral history, legend. And we see that everything overlaps and they confirm each other. The picture that we're seeing is that there are some big, scary reptiles that walk around that man talked about, wrote about, and drew about. That's what we that you know, that is what we see. Now, credible historians of great repute also wrote about dragons and flying reptiles as matter of fact creatures. Here are just a few. Herodotus, the Greek historian of 400 B.C., Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian of 1st century A.D., and Pliny the Elder, the Roman historian of 1st century A.D. These historians, the historians here are not purveyors of myth. These are the heavyweights of history. These are the big dogs, all right? Both Pliny and Josephus spoke of the strategy to release the ibis, which is a bird, to contend against the reptiles. And Josephus directly in indicates flying reptiles. But according to evolutionary thought, these kind of flying reptiles would have been gone for millions of years. Now, Josephus' account is one of my favorites. It's particularly lucid because he's talking about Moses while he's still living in Pharaoh's court. And he's leading an Egyptian army for Pharaoh against Nubia. It's an extra-biblical account about Moses. I'll read it. He wrote, Josephus wrote, For when the ground was difficult to be passed over because of the multitude of serpents, which it produces in vast numbers, some of which ascend out of the ground unseen and also fly in the air, and do come upon men at unawares and do them a mischief. He went on and said, Moses invented a wonderful stratagem to preserve the army safe and without hurt, for he made baskets like unto arks of sedge and filled them with the ibises and carried them along with them. Which animal is the greatest enemy to serpents imaginable? For they fly from them when they come near them, and as they fly, they are caught and devoured by them. What an amazing 
story of Josephus. So these flying reptiles were, su were such a, I guess, a problem that Moses actually had to have a strategy to deal with them when he marched out to war. Here is the account by Herodotus in 400 B.C. There is a place in Arabia situated very near the city of Buto to which I went on hearing of some winged serpents. And when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to describe. The form of the serpent is like that of the water snake, but he has wings without feathers and is like as possible to the wings of a bat. Again, we get another description, but this one from Herodotus, that these things had wings like a bat. Now here's the Roman historian Pliny. This is his account of dragons. He wrote, Ethiopia produces dragons. Not so, not so large as those of India, but still 20 cubits in length. Now are we to assume that he was able to measure, using the measuring units of his day, a mythological beast? No. And he compared the dragons of one country to the dragons of another. In a very matter-of-fact way. There's nothing sensational here. He's like, yeah, they're about 20 cubits in length. Then, Pliny continues to explain that dragons hunt elephants. Elephants were the prey of these giant predators, but sometimes the attack would leave them both dead. Pliny wrote, The contest is equally fatal to both. The elephant vanquished falls to the earth and by its weight crushes the dragon which is entwined around it. Were elephants being eaten by mythological creatures? No, they weren't. Pliny was speaking of a very real reptile that was large enough to not only attack elephants, but to kill elephants. No reptile today could do that. Only a T-Rex or some kind of other large theropod would even attempt a creature to do something like that. Now, from a biblical perspective, we would expect that the massive dinosaurs to feed upon mammals. That makes sense, like elephants, rhinos, and hippos. And it also seems like an odd thing for Pliny just to make up. Now, we went through, so look at everything we've talked about, the archaeology, the history, the oral history, the written history, the legends, and they all confirm and overlap with each other. They all show a picture, a unified picture of some big, scaly reptile living with man. We know what these reptiles fed upon, we know what they looked like, we know that men killed them, and they come from, these stories and come from around the globe. And in my book, I have a lot more evidence of this. Now on to paleontology, which is the study of fossils. And is there, man, is there evidence in paleontology for man and dinosaur coexistence? Now paleontology, a fossil is, a, is actually rock, it's not a bone. When, it, when an animal dies, if it gets fossilized, when an animal dies, it gets covered up with water and mud, all right, and the, and the minerals in that water and that sediment replace the organic material that is the bone and makes it into rock. And so a pure fossil is actually a pure rock. There's no bone left in it. And that's really important because paleontology is a subset of geology. So it's really the study of rocks. And that really, that may give us some light to this next misunderstanding, if you will. Because a few years ago, if you were here this morning, you know this piece. A few years ago, there was a Tyrannosaurus rex that was excavated from what is called the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. Now, this creature was special because it was not completely fossilized. It still had bone, which is a problem if they, want to, if they want to contend this thing is 68 million years old because it's organic material already. Yet the paleontologists who found it, they, they were convinced it was 65 million years old because, of that, because that is what they thought the rocks were. Well, they had to cut this thing in half just to get it out because it was so large. They flew it out by helicopter. When they got back to the lab, they decided to look at this bone underneath a microscope. And this is what they saw. They saw blood cells, protein fragments, soft, flexible, resilient tissue that when stretched, it snapped back to its original shape. This creature was not even, yet, was not even done decomposing. Yet the, the paleontologists, the rock people, who are fervent disciples of Darwin, allowed their belief in really old rocks to skew how they viewed the fleshy evidence. Despite all the data that we have of rapid decomposition, they fell back on their faith of rocks and decided that soft, flexible, resilient tissue can hang around for 68 million years after all. There is no different than Mayer's fossil legend hypothesis, remember? Their faith in evolution is so strong that when faced with evidence that stands in opposition against evolution, 
They simply ignore the data. We talked about that this morning. My friends, there is no way this dinosaur is over 65 million years old. Flesh decomposes. It's not 65,000 years old. This dinosaur died relatively recently. And you don't need a fancy academic degree. You just need the common sense that God gave you. Now, what's extraordinary is that scientists from around the world, they were shocked by this. And then they got the big bright idea, well, wait a minute. You know, some of the dinosaur fossils I have aren't fossilized yet either. So they started to look at their bones. In May of, 2000, uh, May of 2009, this was reported in Australia. Blood tissue extracted from duck-billed dinosaur bone. It happened again. So a faucet was turned out. Once they knew this stuff was there, people around the world started looking. And again, this was reported in 2010. 80 million year old Mosasaur fossil has soft retina and blood residue. Retina tissue. Yet they still believe it lasted 80 million years old, except it has retina tissue and blood residue. So the T-Rex was not a one-time thing. There are now more creatures even beyond this that are being found that have soft tissue in them. This is powerful, powerful evidence for our biblical worldview. Paleontology, legends, written history, oral history, archaeology, they all confirm each other. They all have evidence that man walked with a big giant reptile. So let's get to biblical history. Let's get back to the start of this because the Bible is where we started from to even have us start searching for these answers. And let's first discuss Noah's flood in the ark. The obvious question is, were dinosaurs on the ark? Well, let's do a, re a quick recap of the size of the ark, shall we? The dimensions given to us in the Bible make the ark large enough to hold over 500 railroad cars. So next time you're at a, at a stop, just start counting those railroad cars that are passing you, and you'll get the idea of how many 500 is. The carrying capacity we estimate to be over 15,000 tons on the ark. That is a major barge. Also, in the Journal of Creation in 1994, they reported that a study that was done by Korean naval architects concluded that the ark's size and dimension that was given to us in the ancient book of Genesis were simply ideal for staying afloat in turbulent waters. I submit to you that it is impossible for a book of mere fairy tale to have accidentally fallen into such perfect building specs. The ark exhibited excellent design for its intended purpose. That is a beautiful thing. According to the Bible, we know that pairs of animals were brought into the ark. Remember, two by twos. So yes, dinosaurs would have been brought onto the ark. But how many are we talking about and how big were they? Well, there are only about 50 dinosaur kinds. That means only about 100 dinosaurs would have been on the ark. And don't think they were all that big. Dinosaurs start out, like everything else, very small. These are fossilized dinosaur eggs. And think of a dinosaur egg about the size of an oblong softball, a big one, that is. And Noah, so they wouldn't have been very big. And Noah would have not taken on big, fully grown dinosaurs. He would have taken on young ones that had a large reproductive life ahead of them. Plus, babies don't eat as much as adults. They're just easier to manage. He probably would have had baby lions, baby cubs, you know, baby bears as well, all that. Now, to illustrate the growth of dinosaurs, this is, uh, this is my hand next to a juvenile Acrocanthosaurus track that I visited down in Texas. That dinosaur, it, you can see, I don't know if you can see it or not, right here, but the, the uh, dinosaur footprint is really not that much bigger than my hand is. Now, here's a picture of me in the same area next to an adult Acrocanthosaurus track, down here at the bottom. So we're talking this was now a very, very large creature. And what was funny about this is that that imprint of the dinosaur track was deep enough that the leaves got down in it. And when the wind came and blew all the rest of the leaves away, the, the leaves were still in the dinosaur trackway, which made it really easy to find. In fact, here is a picture of the, of the trackway. You see all the dinosaur tracks with all the leaves in it? They just popped right out. I guess the Lord knew I needed help finding it. So he's like, here's a bone, you know, there you go. But it was actually fascinating to see all those leaves still in it. Now, some may be asking, if you're, you know, they would ask me, if dinosaurs were on the ark, then why didn't just the Bible say so? Why didn't, why didn't the Bible say dinosaurs in it? Well, of course, that question comes from a perspective of English Bibles. Sir Richard Owen created the word dinosaur, which means terrible lizard, in the year 1841. But the King James Bible was first published in 1611, and I noticed 
You guys knew that. It's right up there on the wall. All right, so it was 230 years before the word dinosaur was even invented. So, of course, the word dinosaur would not be in the English Bible. But the behemoth is in the Bible in Job chapter 40. And the Bible says that, behold, behemoth. He goes, I made, a, made along with thee. You, he eats grass like an ox, has a powerful back and belly, bones like iron, chief in the ways of God. And chief, the Hebrew behind that, means just the largest of the ways of God. Tail like a cedar. No animal other than a giant seropod, that's like a brachiosaurus, fits the full description found in Job. A lot of commentaries make this creature out to be an elephant or a hippo. But have you ever seen a an elephant's tail or a hippo's tail? Does that look like a tail of a cedar to you? No, an elephant's tail is not any better. It's like a flap of skin. It's like a tassel. No, this is the kind of cedar the Bible was talking about. And I hope you can see this. That's a big tree. That's a big tree. Only a giant seropod dinosaur would have a tail like that. No other creatures, I mean, the, the behemoth can be no other creature that we know of than one of these dinosaurs. Now, also in the Bible, in the King James, dragons are mentioned 35 times in your King James Bible. Thirteen of those times are in Revelation and is referring to Satan and evil. But the rest of those are in the Old Testament. But it's not just the King James, but everything before it. The Septuagint, the Wycliffe, the Geneva, all have agreement with the King James that they concluded dragons were real creatures and there was nothing mystical about them. One of the most enlightening passages in dragon studies is Jeremiah 51:34, and I'll read it. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a dragon. He hath filled his belly with my delicates. He hath cast me out. Now, why did I use, of all the, of all the verses in the, in the King James and the Old Testament I could have used, why did I pick out Jeremiah 51.34? Well, that's because John Calvin, the Bible expositor, the great theologian of the 16th century, provided enlightening commentary on this verse. Calvin wrote, Then he says, He has swallowed me like a dragon. It is a comparison different from the former, but very, yet very suitable. For dragons are those who devour a whole animal. And this is what the prophet means. Though these comparisons do not in everything agree, yet as to the main thing they are most appropriate, even to show that God suffered his people to be devoured, as though they had been exposed to the teeth of a lion or a bear, or as though they had been prey to a dragon. It cannot be overlooked that Calvin speaks with such ease about the dragon in this passage and implies no special language to this creature for us to think that this dragon is mythological. In fact, he compares the predatorial aspects of the dragon to a lion and a bear. Calvin believed dragons to be lethal predators, and that is why he believed God used them in this analogy. There's nothing mystical about them. Now, we are shifting gears a little bit here because there's another issue that needs to be addressed. Let us not forget that it is not, it is not enough for the evolutionist to just claim dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. The evolutionist has to explain where the dinosaurs came from and how one evolved into many. Let's not give them a pass on their base claim. If dinosaurs are a product of evolution, then there has to be evidence of dinosaurs evolving. That's what we would expect them to produce. In the journal Science, which is a secular journal, this chart was put forth to demonstrate the nice and neat dinosaur evolution, evolution from one creature down to the bottom into the, into the many. All right? Now, here's the problem with this chart. It's filled with what is called ghost lineages. A ghost line, a lineage is shown in the evolutionary ancestral tree when there is no evidence supporting that evolving lineage, a.k.a. there's no transitional forms. So they pencil in the hypothesized transitional creatures they need for evolution. That's what a ghost lineage is. It's their term. So what is worse, that there are evolutionary lines that are hypothesized or that it happens so often they actually have a name for it? Now, Dr. Don Batten, a, a colleague of mine at CMI, provided this chart for me, and he highlighted in this chart 
the ghost lineages on this chart. The red lines show the missing hypothesized connections. The blue lines show large gaps in between so-called evolutionary ancestors. Do, can you see the colors out there? All right. So let me go back here again. Oh, hold on. Now, if you do not believe in ghosts, this is what this chart would look like with nothing hypothesized. There you have it. It looks like everything was created within their own kinds, doesn't it? There's no connection. There's no evolution. It's just distinct kinds. So someone might ask me right now, wait a minute, Derek, are you claiming that they're just making all this stuff up then? Because that doesn't seem, like, that doesn't seem very scientific to just make all these ghost lineages and claim that it's a fact. Now, to answer that question, we will turn to Adrian Mayer, an evolutionist herself, in a book published by Princeton University Press, in which she interviewed and quoted many of the, of the finest, if you can use that term, evolutionary minds in paleontology. And this is what she said. Seeking visions might seem light years away from scientific inquiry, yet the most creative paleontologists can be described as visionaries and many respected scientists have described important theoretical breakthroughs that came to them as revelations while they slept or daydreamed. What an alarming paragraph, and one that should be highly offensive to anyone that has taken the word of evolutionary paleontologists as scientific fact. Evolutionary paleontologists are the ones responsible for creating the lineage of evolution. Yet so-called respected paleontologists are getting breakthroughs in their dreams. Mayer continues, This hyper-aware dream state is called lucid dreaming or power dreaming by neuropsychologists. Paleontologists who trust their dreams about the meaning of fossils are perhaps not so unlike Native American discoverers of fossils during vision quests. Certainly paleontology solving the mystery of stone creatures that will never be seen walking the earth inspires dreams and theoretical narratives. My friends, theoretical narratives is a fancy word for making stuff up. My friends, do you realize that paleontologists are the ones responsible for providing the evolutionary argumentation? They're the ones that saying this creature evolved into that, which evolved into that, which evolved into that, and that took like millions of years to happen. It's these guys that are providing that for the world. And it's these guys that are getting breakthroughs in their theory while they're dreaming. In contrast, how detailed is our history found in the Bible? This timeline is constructed from the Bible. Jesus is represented at the bottom right corner. Right there. Okay? And his genealogy traces all the way back to Adam and then directly to God. Generation to generation with men's names and often their ages. Many of them are also known outside of the biblical narratives and other history. As an example, the, the, the 16 grandsons of Noah are all known in secular history. How remarkable is that? It is the most detailed account, the Bible is, is the most detailed account of Earth's history available in any worldview. God did not leave us in the dark. He did not leave us to speculate. All the genealogies of, you know, he begot him, begot him, begot him, that is kind of get boring to read, are actually the detailed history that researchers love because it gives us the facts. The people who contend that the Bible is a fairy tale and a product of just fanciful storytelling are not educated about the Bible. Fairy tale is never this detailed. Fairy tale cannot give a detailed account for the entire history of our existence. Fairy tale doesn't even try to do it. But this is our Bible. This is, this is beautiful if you can see this. It's a fascinating piece of art. This image was awarded an honorable mention by National Geographic in their 2008 International Science and Engineering Visualization Challenge. That's a mouthful. The name of this piece is called Visualizing the Bible. The Bible's 1,189 chapters are plotted along the horizontal axis at the bottom of the image. With each bar's length, determined by the number of verses. See all these dashes? Those are the chapters. The arcs above the graph that you see that are colored show the 63,779 cross-references between each chapter in our Bible. 
The stunning interconnectivity of scriptures led one of the artists to say, it almost looks like one monolithic volume. Praise God. <laughs> Yet 44 different authors were used to write these 66 books of the Bible. How did they accomplish this thousands of years ago? It doesn't seem humanly possible, does it? No matter what worldview you come from, the Bible is the most amazing book this world has ever seen. If you discount the Bible and its history as just make-believe, you are doing yourself an enormous disservice because the position is simply not defensible once you have seen the evidence. How could we ever trade this beautifully woven history given to us by the mercy of God and exchange it for make-believe dreaming? I know that I can't. Revelation 12.7 says this, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. My friends, Satan is compared to and likened to a dragon, isn't he? Satan is the deceiver of the whole world. He was a murderer from the beginning. He is our enemy that attacks us. And God used the imagery of the dragon to represent Satan. The dragon throughout all of history has been portrayed as a lethal, ruthless predator that would take down even the largest of prey, like the elephant. God picked the most vicious predator as a symbol of Satan so that we could understand the nature of our adversary. But what if dragons actually were a product of our imagination? What if they are simply a story with no basis in reality? Then that would mean that God chose a mythical creature with no truth behind it to compare our greatest enemy to. And if that were the case, the metaphor of Satan as a dragon is a failed metaphor. And God just portrayed our adversary as a make-believe creature who doesn't even exist. That kind of deception is not the nature of our God. But it is the nature of Satan to perpetuate so many lies. The final chapter of the book, Dragons or Dinosaurs, is called The Thomas Society. And is referring to the Doubting Thomas. I'll read it. It said, Jesus was speaking. He said, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach out, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Why did Thomas stop doubting? He saw the evidence of the resurrection, didn't he? He saw the evidence. I believe today that we are in the age of evidence, which is why I say that we live in the Thomas Society. The naturalistic evidence that testifies for our Bible is so powerful in this day and age that it's like it's a renaissance period for Christianity. It is as if Jesus is walking around saying, put your finger in my hand, put your hand in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. My friends, every last bit of naturalistic evidence I have seen points not merely to an intelligent designer, but to Christ the Creator. I've enjoyed my time with you so much. I've had three sessions with many of you. And thank you so much for having me. May God bless you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand, and I will point you out. Stand up, speak loudly and clearly, so that everyone may hear, and then uh, Mr. Isaacs will try to answer your questions. So do we have a question? Mr. McCoy.
Well, the theory that CMI has put forward is called time dilation. And you're basically talking about how did starlight get to Earth. All right, well, time dilation is the idea that time ticks faster, and it does. It ticks faster at one place than it does at another. And using that concept, you know, this, the, the, the ability for light to get from something that is millions, billions of light years away, if it is passing through time quicker, it can get to Earth in that 6,000-year window. Now, I think if you take that concept, and, and I, I guess I would differ with you a little bit on the universe appears older than what it is, because we don't have another universe to compare it to. Uh, we don't really know how old a, a universe should look, other than we know the universe is 6,000 years old, and this is what it looks like. Um, if you look at Job, it, it talks about the, the heavens and the earth being stretched out. All right, and God did that. He stretched out the heavens and the earth. Um, if you take that, if you, if you take that literally, then you have this concept of in the beginning God's created the heavens and the earth. And as He's going through that six-day creation, I believe that the Bible is strong enough and authoritatively enough to say that there might have been basically the universe was smaller at the beginning, and God then stretched out the heavens and the earth. Now, this is not the Big Bang. Don't anyone, please, don't read that into it. Because he did create all of that, but the, then he stretched out everything. If you take that stretching and then add to it time dilation, if you would go to creation.com and just search time dilation, you can get a very, very good detailed description of what that is. It gets more complex than what I'm willing to do now because it would take a little while. But if you combine time dilation with the Lord stretching out the heavens and the earth, I really think... Um, the, the light getting to earth is, is not a problem, and we, do, can, we can offer an explanation for that. Anybody else? In the back. Yes, sir. Yes. So basically, the question is, why did dinosaurs go extinct? Right, okay. If you look at Genesis, talk about in, in the creation week, that God separated all the water, he made, took all the waters into one place and land appeared. Well, then by deduction, that means all the land was in one place. And so the, the concept is, and this is, um, evolution has finally caught on to it, but there was a supercontinent at the beginning, at the very beginning of creation. That supercontinent probably would have been very centrally located on the earth and just in a perfect place when it comes to environment, tropical, you know, just a perfect, perfect environment. Then the flood came, all right? Three events happened at the flood. You had the windows of heaven opening up. You have fountains of great deep bursting forth. Then you had the rains for um, 40 days and 40 nights. The concept in creation is that the windows of heaven, heaven opening up were meteor strikes. So massive meteor showers. Then you had the fountain of great deep breaking forth, and you have volcanic and ga volcanic eruptions from the crust, and guys are shooting up, so breaking that crust apart, so violent, violent earthquakes. And then you have the, the rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, the reason I'm bringing all this in is think of the turbulence on earth that the flood would have caused. It was not a tranquil water. It was not just a nice bathtub. We're talking a violent, violent, turbulent time during that flood. Now, when the... Waters receded. It took a long time for them to receive. To recede. Noah and the animals stepped out of the ark. What are you going to see? You're not going to see the same natural environment that was before the ark, uh, before the flood. You're going to see a damaged, damaged environment. And then you only have a few creatures really coming off of that. Four to five hundred years. So, take, so we have few creatures, an environment that is not as good as it was before the flood. Then say five to six hundred years, maybe seven hundred years after the flood, we believe there was a major ice age, one singular ice age. Now, think of an elephant today. An elephant weighs about seven tons. It'll eat three to four hundred pounds of roughage a day. That's a lot of plants per day elephants put away. Think of a brachiosaurus that some think weighed up to eighty tons, so ten times the size of an elephant. And we believe they were herbivores. Think of how much roughage they would have had to eat each day. Before the flood, in that perfect environment where we know plants were bigger than plants were today, 
We know that through fossil evidence, they're just huge, huge plants. And they have all the nutrition they ever could have needed beforehand. After the flood, that world it got broken apart. The Ice Age came, and we can see, what we can see is that the pinching happening where the largest animals that needed the most nutritional, needed the nutrition, were having a hard time surviving. And if you look at the fossil record, it's not just the dinosaurs, but you've got your, your cave bears, you've got your giant sloths, you've got your mastons and mammoths. All these huge creatures have apparently gone extinct. So there was a lot of large creatures with huge nutritional needs that have had a hard time surviving in this post-flood world. They had a hard time getting through you know, the Ice Age. Now, they did extend through the Ice Age. Um, when did the last dinosaur finally die? I don't know. Will we ever know? I, I, I don't think so. What we can say is from the biblical worldview of the, of the earth being broken, of the Ice Age coming after the flood, and having it being more difficult on the large animals to feed themselves, we can see that just nature is becoming a more difficult place for animals to survive. I've seen a figure today, I, I can't document it, but I've seen a figure today that 30% of the creatures alive today are in danger of extinction. That's why I, I read on some natural um, conservationist site. If that is true, that is a huge number. So really the entire world is dying. And so what we see are the giant dinosaurs were the first ones to go. And I think that's what we see. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, they can't explain it at all because they're like, well, there's a meteorite that hit the Yucatan Peninsula. Well, why didn't that meteorite kill everything else then? You know? So they really, they, they bomb on that one. From our worldview, we go, you know something? The world's not as good as it was before the flood. Those giant creatures had huge nutritional needs. And then the, the creatures that would have fed on those giant creatures, like the T-Rex and things like that, you know, all of a sudden their food sources diminished as well. And so we just see a struggling nature, a struggling environment where it's getting harder and harder and harder to survive and everything is going extinct, as it would seem. The dinosaurs were just really kind of the first to go. Um, so anyways, that's, that's how I understand that. Yes, sir. Yes. I, when I just read the story from context, I think of the smaller pterodactyls that would be yay big. Just out of context. Yeah. I mean, because your, your pterosaurs range from the size of a Quetzalcoatlus, which is like the size of a giraffe, down to 18 inches. So I would think for them to devour the ibis and for the ibis to be used as a decoy and things like that, you know, you're not dealing with the Quetzalcoatlus. I think you're dealing with your smaller ones. But it's a fascinating account, though, isn't it? I mean, I start geeking out about Moses. I mean, that's just really something. <laughs> that's Josephus. Yep. And in my book, I if you in my book, I actually have the um, the actual reference. Why don't you show them your books and the things that are at least up here? Uh, there is a display table, a bunch of display tables with many creation resources out in the lobby. And uh, when we dismiss this evening, you're invited to go back there and look at that. Uh, he has a couple of books that he's written. Mm -hmm. I've got, I did the Dragons or Dinosaurs, and that's where all the information from the talk came from this book. Now, when I got done with Dragons or Dinosaurs, I realized that there was even more information that needed to be told on the subject. So I went and interviewed really the world leaders in Young Earth Creation, and that's where the documentary came from. So they were designed, and I specifically asked questions, and I interviewed them. I asked questions to not cannibalize this, but augment it, to add to it. You know, and so I'm talking to PhD scientists about their field to explain dinosaur coexistence with man and also the age of the earth. Um, and so they, that's, they were meant to really go together as, as, a, as a pair. Um, I, had a, I had a guy come up to me in Georgia and said that he's, for the DVD, you know, he has bought in 12 of these and handed them out as, a, as basically as a witnessing tool. And the reason why in both of my books, and this is just me, you know, we are not here to win an argument for argument's sake, are we? Who cares if we can win an argument with somebody? We've got to remove barriers to lead them to Jesus Christ. That is the only reason 
that I do this, is that people believe dinosaurs are millions of years old, therefore they think the Bible is a lie. People believe that evolution is true, therefore they think the Bible is a lie. If we break down those barriers and take away their beliefs in evolution, then they're going to have, they're going to, have to force themselves to reconcile with the truth of the Bible and reconcile with God. That is why we do what we do. And so both my, both, everything that I do is going to lead to Jesus Christ. And one of the things that I love about this documentary is that uh, a pastor named Brian Hughes, he sits on the board with John MacArthur. Okay, but he has, a, he has a, a church in Montana. And I asked him at the end of this documentary, I said, I want you, you don't hear my voice, but I, I explained to him, I said, I want you to explain what does it mean to be born again. It just, I mean, give us an, an authentic explanation because people are going to be watching this video that are not safe. And in today's world, God can mean almost anything to anybody anymore, right? It's become a term that is, is a throwaway term. It's just, oh, your God is not your God who's not your God. So we have to focus more on Jesus Christ, all right? And so we, I wanted to give a, a, just a very good explanation, a biblical answer to what does it mean to be born again. And Brian Hughes, just, he just nailed it in that. And so it really is. The documentary goes through all this evidence, but it doesn't just leave them hanging. It takes them to Jesus Christ. And as a church... You know, that's what we're about. You know, amen? Amen. That's what we're about. So, any other questions? Uh, did you want to pass around your flipboards to get the uh, creation? I, I, I don't have them up here. If, if, if you have not, um, our best resource, and I appreciate the pastor bringing this up, our best resource is the magazine. Okay, because it's written in layman's terms. Uh, I really, really encourage you. It's only 25 bucks for a year subscription. It's the cost of going out to the movies or going out to dinner with your family. Man, I, I, I really think, give yourself a chance on this. Give our ministry a chance to help your family to equip you against the secular attacks. Um, if you want that, you can sign up for it in the back. Um, but really, our, our kids, you know, these kids, these young ones, are going to be attacked with things that a lot of you are, have, have never experienced because you didn't go through the, the schools of, of today. But it's vicious out there. It really is vicious. The teachers target Christians, and they try to break them down. And we need to equip our kids to just stand strong in the faith because you can't always be there with those kids. So you just need to give them the resources so that they cannot, you know, they can stand strong and glorify God in what they do. Okay, yes. No, the old earth creationists, people that tried to compromise the six day, you know, they tried to say that the, there's a group of Christians who tried to fit those millions and billions of years into the Bible. And sometimes they point to that verse and go, look, a, a day is like a thousand years to God. Well, okay, if you give them to the letter of that, then they're only adding 6,000 years to the entire equation, not millions and millions of years. But let me, that verse is really, in, in my opinion, it's an argument for literal days because God is outside of time. Okay, time does not that has no effect on God. What I mean by that, and we watched a video that talked about time dilation a little bit. And if you'll remember in that video, that time changes compared on where you're at. Right. Right. When astronauts go up and they circle around the Earth, they age at a different rate than what we do on Earth. Isn't that wild? That's true. They age at the rate. So what do we know from that? What we know is that time manipulates man. That we are manipulated by time. If we age at a different rate up there than we do down here, time has the power to manipulate our bodies. Well, can God be manipulated in any way? No, he can't. Therefore, God is outside of time. He is not able to be manipulated. So when he's saying a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day, time does not matter to God. So when he, he's outside of it. So when he tells us, I did this in six days. It is from our perspective, not his. Time was created for us to measure beginning and an end. That's what time does. God has no beginning, has no end, so he has no need for time. So when he's saying to me, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day, I'm outside of it, I have nothing to do with it, but I've created time for you so that you can measure time, you can measure days. But why does he want us to measure days? Because this is a timeline that, that you know, we know the world is coming to an end. He gave us prophecy so that we can look at the signs of the time and we know where we are at because of prophecy. And he gave us time as a measurement tool. 
And so, th- does that make sense? Does that make sense? So that he's outside of time, and it's really apologetic that time relates to us. And he says it in six days. It's from our perspective. It's our six days. Okay. Are there any other questions? Just right, over here. Yes. Okay, very good. Derek, thank you very much. It's been a a pleasure having you. We do encourage you back there in the back to see the resources. We've been challenged tonight uh, because we are in a spiritual warfare. The New Testament makes that very clear. Uh, And the field of battle, which is most critical today, is this area of evolution. Because it seems so scientific, it seems so reasonable, seems so rational to the mind that does not know God. And it is being used to attack our Christian young people. This morning, Brother Isaacs pointed out how many are leaving by the time they are 18, uh, something 80 to 85 percent of Christian young people uh, leaving the church and never coming back again. And that equates sort of to their first year of college when many of them for the first time are going to be really hit heavily in their freshman biology classes with this theory of evolution. And so um, it is something that needs to be well taught in the body of Christ, there are answers. There are answers that are in harmony with the Word of God, and they are things that are not all that difficult to understand, at least on the basic level. And so, since we are soldiers, let's uh, stand and sing number 723. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies through His eternal Son. Number 723. able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. 
to the only wise God, our Savior, the honor and glory, majesty and power, both now and forever. Amen.